There are a lot of KISS ranking videos on YouTube. Rankings are fun and people tend to like them, but I didn't just want to do another one of those, so I decided to go the extra mile. I will not just be ranking the 20 KISS studio albums, but also all of the related KISS albums. So what counts as related? Obviously, the various solo albums by the individual members count, so do albums by bands that featured a member of KISS in a prominent songwriting role. So Black and Blue and Union count, but the Alice Cooper albums that Eric Singer played on do not. The Wendy O. Williams album counts since it was produced by Gene, he co-wrote several songs, and it features several KISS members throughout. Wicked Lester counts, of course. I've also included some EPs, mostly for the sake of giving Vinnie Vincent, Mark St. John, and Bruce Kulick some more spaces on the list. In total, it's about 63 albums, and I'm going to be ranking them from my least favorite to my favorite. Also, you're going to be mad because my list is different than your list. It's all opinions, guys. Number 63, Euphoria by Vinnie Vincent. Released in 1996, it was originally titled The EP before being changed to Euphoria. It was intended to be a preview of Vinny's then-upcoming album, Guitar Mageddon, which never came out. This is the last official release of new material from Vinny, and I don't like it. I have made no attempt to hide my distaste for Vinny, and for the most part, I really don't like his solo stuff. I think it is obnoxious. I don't like his guitar tone at all, and it's off-putting to me. I am also not the biggest fan of Robert Fleischman's singing. It's not that Vinny and Fleischman aren't talented, they obviously are, I just don't like what they're doing. I do think the title track has a solid catchy chorus, and you have to give Vinny some credit. When this was released, most artists from the 70s and 80s had adapted into a heavier, more alternative sound to keep with the times, but Vinny stuck to his guns. I just happen to think his guns are really annoying. The ultimate reason this comes in last is because out of everything on this list, this is the thing that I would least want to listen to again. Number 62, One For All, Peter Chris. This should come as a surprise to no one. This is not a popular release, and many would say that it is definitively the worst release in the KISS catalog. Now, I don't want to just shit all over it, because Peter put a lot of heart into it, and I think it kind of crushed him when it didn't go over well. The album's biggest issue is that it sounds bad. It's unpleasant to listen to with a terrible mix. It's corny, and most disappointingly, Peter's singing isn't great. Some of the vocals feel out of place and inappropriate, which is strange. Peter's voice is usually a strength, but it doesn't fit this material. I will say that the album does have potential. There are moments or ideas that could have worked. A producer could have really done something with this. The most consistent problem with the solo albums by KISS members is they produce it themselves and most of them aren't great at it. Overall, this is a really weak effort. Number 61, Invasion, Vinnie Vincent. This was Vinnie's first solo album. I will say some nice things first. Boys Are Gonna Rock is okay. I like the arrangement of the verses. Dana Storm's bass lick is cool. Back on the Streets is okay, and No Substitute features some really good pop hooks. But I cannot stand Vinnie's solos. His tone is obnoxious to the point that I think he's trying to be annoying. The album ends with two minutes of alarms. The album is lame and boring with a few decent moments. Number 60, White Tiger. After being fired from Kiss, Mark formed White Tiger. They only released one album in 1986. I like Mark's tone better than Vinny's, which is why this album ranks a little higher. I don't love David Donato's voice, but he's fine. Overall, it's just generic hair metal and it doesn't leave much of an impression. A couple of decent songs, but nothing great. Number 59, Black and Blue. Tommy Thayer got his start in the music business as the lead guitarist of a band called Black and Blue. Their debut album was released in 1984. I don't love the production. It's small, and I especially don't like the drum sound. The Strong Will Rock and Hold On to 18 are decent tracks, but the cover of Action really sucks. They don't add much to it, and it feels kind of slow. Overall, the album is cheesy and generic. 
If you like hair metal, there are much better options. This is not as strong of a debut as Rats or Dawkins, which were released around the same time. Number 58, Peter Chris. I don't want to spend too much time on albums I've reviewed on my channel. I love I Can't Stop the Rain, and I think the cover of Tossin' and Turnin' is solid. There's some other decent stuff, but for the most part, I think this album is corny and lame. Number 57, Asshole, Gene Simmons. This is Gene's second and final solo album released in 2004. The biggest problem is that it sounds like shit, which is really frustrating because some of the material could really work if there was a producer here and not just Gene being as cheap as possible. The only song that sonically sounds okay is the cover of Firestarter, which, no shock, had an actual producer on it. Songs like Now That You're Gone and Whatever Turns You On could have been great, but the production fails them. The former could have been one of Gene's best songs. The lyrics and the vocal performance are great, but it ends up corny and kinda dumb sounding. For God's sake, Gene wrote a song with Bob Dylan with a pretty good melody, and he turned it into a lame pop song with a shitty drum machine. Why? You have access to Eric Singer, why is this album filled with shitty drum machines? But the album does have some highlights. Sweet and Dirty Love and Weapons of Mass Destruction both feature Bruce on guitar and Eric Singer on drums. The former is the closest any member of KISS has come to recapturing the 70s vibe of the band, and with a proper Eddie Kramer production, could have been a KISS classic. Weapons features a kick-ass solo from Bruce and is a cool heavy track along with Carnival of Souls, although I do prefer the demo to Carnival of Souls, which featured a really great breakdown section. Overall, Asshole is a hodgepodge. It is completely random and inconsistent. There's no vision or drive. It's just Gene throwing shit at the wall, hoping something sticks. And a lot doesn't. Number 56, Gene Simmons. Gene's first solo album has the same problem in that there isn't a cohesive vision, but it sounds a lot better than Asshole and the highlights are really excellent. Mr. Make Believe, See You Tonight, and Man of a Thousand Faces are among Gene's best material. But the album, unfortunately, also features a lot of Gene's worst material. It's hit and miss, but a mess overall. Number 55, W.O.W., Wendy O. Williams. Williams was the lead singer of the Plasmatics who opened for Kiss in the early 80s. Gene liked them, and decided to produce Williams' first solo album. He ended up co-writing several of the songs, and the album features guest appearances from Paul Stanley, Ace Fraley, and Eric Carr, as well as a song co-written by Vinny, which is why it's on this list. Many KISS fans consider it to be the lost KISS album. This is the first time I've listened to the album, and I did not enjoy it. It doesn't sound great. I think Gene was trying to create a sound similar to Creatures of the Night, but the result is muddy. The opening track, I Love Sex, is lame as hell, although I do like Opus in C minor 7, and Bump and Grind features a killer solo from Ace. Also, I don't love William's voice, and overall, the album is kind of boring. Number 54, Without Love, Black and Blue. This is Black and Blue's second album. It has solid pop hooks and some decently fun stuff, I don't mind it, but it's not something I'd ever want to listen to again. Number 53, In Heat, Black and Blue. This was Black and Blue's final album before disbanding, although parts of the band reunited without Tommy to record a fifth album later. Black and Blue opened up for Kiss on the Asylum tour, and Gene decided to produce them following, working on the band's third and fourth albums. He got a much better sound out of the band, especially on this album. In Heat features decent hooks, but is, overall, pretty boring and unmemorable. Number 52, Magic Bullet Theory, Mark St. John. This is Mark's only folding solo album, and it is entirely instrumental. The musicianship is impressive, although I prefer the acoustic stuff over the electric. Bourbon Street and Wait No More are pretty cool, but overall, I would say that this album is pretty boring. Number 51, Mark St. John Project. In the late 80s, Mark formed a band with Peter called The Keep. They recorded some demos, but never a full album, with Peter forming Chris instead. This EP features three of the songs Mark wrote with Peter, 
as well as two instrumental tracks that would later be featured on Magic Bullet Theory. I like No I'm Not Afraid and Baghdad, but it doesn't do much for me otherwise. Number 50, America the Violent, Shake the Faith. Okay, so if you don't know what this is, you're in for a treat. Shake the Faith is Tommy's punk band, which is so funny to me. The only person less punk rock than Tommy Thayer is me. The band formed in 1992, recorded one album that was released in 94, the same year the band disbanded. The 90s saw a resurgence of punk with a lot of people suddenly becoming fans that weren't before. I will say Tommy's guitar playing is good and it's kind of fun. I was born in the 90s, so I have a bit of nostalgia for this kind of rock. And fun fact, the track Antiheroes was featured in the pilot episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It does come across as inauthentic knowing Tommy's work before and after this band. It's hard to take a song like Antiheroes seriously when I know the lead guitarist is so out of place and just trying to fit in with a trend. Number 49, Music from the Elder, our first proper Kiss album of the list. Sure, the comment section's gonna be fun now. Me not liking a goofy 40-year-old concept album is not a personal attack on you. People are really sensitive about this album, apparently. I can take most of these tracks out of context and just enjoy them as songs on their own, World Without Heroes being the big highlight for me. But as an album, I don't think it works. The story concept is half-baked and generic. What story is there is thinly held together, and it comes across as pretentious. Also, I'm sorry guys, I listened to Odyssey again. I know the lyric is Stallion and the Mare, but it still sounds like Stallion and the Bear to me. I don't know what to tell you. Number 48, Wicked Lester. Wicked Lester is of course the band Gene and Paul formed prior to Kiss. They got a deal with Epic Records, recorded an album, and then shelved it. The album was never officially released, but has circulated in bootleg circles for years. It's a little hard to judge the album because I don't think we know the intended track listing. Wikipedia lists it one way, which is the way I chose to listen to it for this video, but my copy had the songs in a different order. As I said in my Kiss Box Set review, there's potential in this. The songs are catchy and memorable, and there's great vocal harmonies. The problem is that the album is overproduced to the point that it's just silly. Number 47, Nasty Nasty, Black and Blue. This is the first Black and Blue album Gene produced, and I think his influence made them a better band. The album is more guitar-driven than the first two, with some cool stuff from Tommy. Number 46, Let Me Rock You, Peter Chris. This is Peter's third solo album, his second after being fired from Kiss. It re-teamed him with producer Vinnie Poncia, who had produced Peter's 78 album, as well as Dynasty and Unmasked. The album also features songs written by Gene and Vinny. Additionally, the album was never released in the US until 1998 because Casablanca put as little effort as possible into promoting Peter's solo efforts. The production is decent. I feel like Elton John was a bit of an influence on this one. That's the vibe I get. It's okay. I enjoy the title track. If you like dad rock, I can see people getting into this. Number 45, Space Invader, Ace Fraley. Ace's anticipated follow-up to Anomaly ended up being a big disappointment for me. Change is great, but other than that, it's just okay. It sounds fine, the songs are fine, but it's boring and a lot of it bleeds together. Number 44, Unfinished Business, Eric Carr. Released in 2011, this was put together by Eric's family. It is a sort of tribute album that features demos, interview snippets, and covers. I really wish they had put on all of his demos untouched. Some are, and those are cool, but some tracks are updated. And the tracks they updated or added stuff to are all kind of lame and generic. There's a cover of All Hell's Breaking Loose that's just the same song with a guy that isn't as good of a singer as Paul, so what's the point? They use Eric's vocal audition tape of Shandy but put an unbelievably corny new arrangement under it. The stuff they didn't mess with is great, and I love that we got it. And the small interview snippets were a nice touch. The highlight of the album is Through the Years, which is a compilation of 
various drum solos throughout Eric's career. Number 43, Out of Control, Peter Chris. This is Peter's first album after being fired from Kiss, and I really like the songs that feel like they were inspired by that, by myself and my life. Peter clearly had something to prove, and it's reflected in some of his strongest writing here. Unfortunately, I find the production to be kind of corny, and some of the material is cheesy and lame. Side 2 is a lot stronger, though. Number 42, Rockology, Eric Carr. Released in 1999, this first tribute was produced by Bruce and comprised of various demos. It's obviously a little hard to judge this against the other albums on the list, because some of the material isn't done. It's demos. But there is stuff here that is just great, some of which should have been Kiss songs like Eyes of Love. Imagine how good that would sound with Gene and Paul on background vocals. Number 41, All Systems Go, Vinnie Vincent Invasion. Vinnie's second and final full-length album. I think this is much better than the first. Chrysalis Records didn't like Fleischmann, so he was replaced with Mark Slaughter, whose voice I prefer. The overall tone of the album is better, less over the top, and I like the acoustic guitars layered throughout the album. I'd honestly really enjoy an acoustic instrumental album from Vinnie, based on You Know I'm Pretty Shot. The reason this ranks higher than some of these other albums is because Love Kills and That Time of Year are two of the best songs Vinnie ever wrote. Other than that, I don't think much of the album, but those two songs are great. Number 40, Origins Volume 2, Ace Frehley. The most recent release by The Spaceman, I did a review of it on my channel. It's a mixed bag. Some of the covers are really cool and the guest stars are awesome. But there's a lot of stuff on the album that I found a little dull. It was disappointing overall, but the good stuff really shines. Number 39, Hot in the Shade. The album's biggest problem is its lackluster production and overcorrection of Crazy Nights. I understand the intention, but it just sounds small, and Kiss shouldn't sound small. The album is also filled with useless filler all over the place some of the worst songs they ever wrote, especially Gene. But the album also features some of my favorite Kiss songs. I could never hate an album that features Forever, Hide Your Heart, and Rise to It. Number 38, Animalize. This is half of a great album. I absolutely love all of Paul's songs. Killer stuff. Gene's material? Less so. His songs really drag down the album, which is unfortunate. Number 37, Cat number one, Chris. As I mentioned earlier, Chris was a band Peter formed following his work with Mark. This album is the result with a heavier sound obviously inspired by the musical trends of the 90s. I like Angry Peter, so it's cool to have a heavier rock album from him with great vocals and drumming. The mix isn't great. I think the vocals are a little too low, but this is pretty solid overall. Number 36, Second Sighting. Fraley's Comet. This was Ace's second release post-Kiss, and it is somewhat notorious for Ace being kinda checked out on this one. Guitarist and vocalist Todd Howard had to pick up a lot of the slack. I will say I think Howard's stuff is great. I love his voice, and I think he wrote some really fun, catchy stuff. Ace's material is pretty mediocre outside of Insane, which brings the album down. Number 35, Got to Get Back, KKB. KKB was a band Bruce was in in the early 70s, although they didn't have a name at the time. They recorded a few songs and were inspired by Cream. In 2008, Bruce released the songs on an EP called 1974. In 2015, Bruce reissued the EP with a new song recorded by the band, Got to Get Back. The EP features some great solos from Bruce. It's fun, classic rock. Nothing mind-blowing, and the songs bleed together a little, but it's solid. Number 34, Spaceman, Ace Fraley. Released in 2018, this album features two songs co-written by Ace and Gene together. Those tracks are the selling point, but ended up being a bit of a disappointment. Pretty generic stuff, although I give Gene credit for finally working his Rain Keeps Fallen demo into a finished song. Other than those two tracks, I think this album is pretty fun. Number 33, Psycho Circus. There's a lot on Psycho Circus that I love. 
some great songs, but there's no cohesion to it. It's random as hell. No one is on the same page, made even more disappointing by the fact that this was supposed to be a reunion album. I love a lot of the songs, and I do have a bit of nostalgia for it, as it was an album I listened to a lot as a kid. Number 32, Sonic Boom. I will always have a soft spot for Sonic Boom. It was the first time I got to experience a new Kiss album, and the tour was the first time I saw the band live. And there are songs like Modern Day Delilah that I think are Kiss classics. The album is hampered by Gene's weaker writing, the lack of originality in Tommy's solos, Paul's strained vocals, and the generally weak production. But I still enjoy quite a bit of it. Number 31, Worlds Apart, Blackjack. In the late 70s, Bruce formed a band with Michael Bolton, yes, that Michael Bolton, called Blackjack. They recorded two albums. This is the second of those. This album is a little more pop than the first, with a heavier emphasis on the keyboards. But I think Bruce's solos are pretty great. The songs are solid and catchy, although Side 2 is much stronger. Stay is the big highlight for me. I love that song. Number 30, Asylum. When I did my review, I was shocked by how much I enjoyed Asylum. I think this is one of the most underrated albums in Kiss's catalog. It's not all great. There's some stuff that is just okay and I really don't like Love's a Deadly Weapon, but I think the album is a lot of fun with a nice blend of heavy rhythm work and great pop hooks. It's also a nice showcase for Bruce and Eric Carr and what they could do. Number 29, ESP. ESP is the Eric Singer Project, featuring Eric on drums and lead vocals, Carl Cochran on bass and lead vocals, John Karabi on rhythm guitar and lead vocals, and Bruce on lead guitar. They recorded a covers album that was released in 1998 before being reissued with additional tracks in 1999. It's almost impossible for me not to like this album. It's my favorite drummer, counting Ace's guest spot on Foxy Lady, my two favorite guitarists, and one of my favorite singers in Karabi. It's great classic rock that sounds really good. The covers are strong with some not obvious choices. And of course, I think Eric just kicks ass all over this album. My only complaint is that I'm not the biggest fan of Cochran's singing voice. Number 28, Audio Dog, Bruce Kulick. This is Bruce's first solo album. I think he is the most successful member of the band at producing their own stuff, although Kurt Cuomo did co-produce this. The instrumentals are cool, the vocal tracks are catchy and fun, and the guitar playing is excellent throughout. Number 27, Hotter Than Hell. Obviously, what holds this record back is its muddy production. Some people really like it. It gives Kiss a darker edge, and I get that. I just don't like the way it sounds. But the songs are great, and that makes up for a lot. Number 26, Lick It Up. This album's a lot of fun. Great production, great songs. The only dud is Dance All Over Your Face, and I'm not the biggest fan of Vinny's solos on the album. Number 25, Transformer, Bruce Kulick. This is Bruce's second solo album. It sounds good, the songs are super catchy, and feature great guitar work. Bruce is certainly the most reliable member of KISS in terms of consistent quality. Number 24, Fraley's Comet, Ace Fraley. This is Ace's first post-KISS release. Kramer's production is solid, I love Anton Figg's drums, and Ace's tone is always great. John Regan is really great on the bass, and as I mentioned, I love Howard's voice. I like this album a lot. I found it at a CD trade poster when I was in middle school, and it reminds me of being that age because of how often I listened to it at the time. Calling to You is a particular highlight. However, there are a couple of tracks I don't like. Ace said at one point that Kiss lost their balls when he left the band, and then wrote shit like dolls. I really hate that song. Number 23, Now and Then, Paul Stanley's Soul Station. I'm gonna get so much shit for ranking this so high. I really like it. I'm not sorry. It came out during a pretty tough time for me, and it made me feel better. And it's often the thing I listen to on the drive home if I have a bad day at work. The original tracks are the highlight, and I think they are a showcase for how good of a songwriter Paul is. I love that stuff. Not all of the covers work for me, with Paul's voice often being the weakest element, which is still so weird to me, but I really enjoy the album. Number 22, Kiss. The debut album. It's hard to argue against. For the most part, these songs really work. The production is lackluster, and some of the songs end up feeling kind of lethargic, 
but I think it's a strong debut. Number 21, Dress to Kill. I think this album is a lot of fun. It's fast, full of energy, and a blast to listen to. The production could be better, but there's an appeal to the less polished version of the band. Number 20, Anomaly, Ace Fraley. Alright, top 20. This was Ace's first album in 20 years, and honestly, I think it was worth the wait. It sounds cool and heavy. It's focused and interesting. Ace really pushed himself on this album. There's some atypical stuff from him. The album is full of great songs. Some of the best stuff Ace has written, in my opinion. My favorite track is the cover of Fox on the Run. That's always been one of my favorite songs, and I think Ace did an amazing cover. The only song I don't like is Space Bear, and I think the spoken word part of A Little Below the Angels is dumb. Number 19, Dynasty. I really like this one. I think the songs are all great. People write it off because of I Was Made For Loving You and the general lighter production, but it works for me. Number 18, Blackjack. This is the first Blackjack album, and I was surprised how much I liked this. I had never listened to these Blackjack albums before this video. There's a Bob Seger vibe to it that I really like. Bolton is almost doing a Seger impression. I just think it's a lot of fun with great leads from Bruce. Number 17, Crazy Nights. There are going to be controversial choices in these top spots. You're going to have to come to peace with it. I don't know what to tell you. I love these songs. I think it's Gene's best material out of the 80s non-makeup era, so not counting Revenge or Carnival of Souls. It's all really fun and catchy. Less keyboards and more guitar would be nice, though. Number 16, Unmasked. A divisive album in the catalog for sure. Many love it, many hate it. I think these are great songs. It's obviously more pop, and I'd like to hear these same songs through Kramer's production, but the album works for me. Number 15, Trouble Walkin', Ace Fraley. After Second Sighting, the choice was made to focus on Ace more as a solo artist and less of the Fraley's Comet band idea. So Howarth chose to leave, with Richie Scarlett actually returning to take his place. Scarlett was the original member of Fraley's Comet before the recording of that first album. The album also features the return of Kramer and Fig, who did not work on Second Sighting. The latter kicks so much ass on the drums here. This album feels like the proper follow-up to Ace's 78 solo album, much more so than either of the Fraley's Comet releases. It's an absolutely kick-ass record. Number 14, Origins Volume 1, Ace Fraley. I feel a little weird putting a covers album this high, but I just really love it. A lot of Ace's choices surprised me, and I think he pulled them off really well. Ace's covers managed to be true to the original, while he also puts his own stamp on it. I think it's great. Number 13, Creatures of the Night. One of the most unique albums in the KISS catalog and how it is more driven by drums than guitars. Eric Carr's drumming combined with Michael James Jackson's production created a really cool signature sound. I'm not a huge fan of Killer, which is why this is ranked a little lower than people might expect, but it's a great album. Number 12, Monster. People are going to hate me for putting Monster above Creatures. I really love Monster. It's one of the most honest albums the band has done. There's a lot less trying to hop on a trend or recreate a previous Kiss album. The band got together and wrote some songs. Obviously, the brick-walled sound is awful, and Paul's voice is a weak spot. But the songs really come through for me. Number 11, BK3, Bruce Kulick. This is Bruce's third and last solo album, although I hope he'll do another one soon. BK3 kicks ass. The album features a lot of guest stars, and they're awesome. They allow for more interesting songwriting than Bruce's first two albums, because he doesn't have to worry about what he can or can't sing. It's a big and epic album with excellent guitar playing. Number 10, Carnival of Souls. Top 10. It's a great showcase for Bruce, who I've made no secret of loving. The songs are really interesting, heavy, and cool. I think it's a really underrated album. Number 9, Revenge. I love Ezrin's production, and it's just cool. That's the best word to describe it. The songs really work, and the performances are all great. Just kick-ass, heavy rock. Number 8, Live to Win, Paul Stanley. Yes, seriously. 
this is probably going to be the most controversial part of this ranking. I remember my mom got me the album for Christmas in 2006, along with the first Kissology DVD. It's a major part of my fandom. I listen to it constantly. It is embedded in my brain. I think these are amazing songs. Some of my favorites Paul has written. Stuff like the title track, Lift, Wake Up Screaming, It's Not Me, and Where Angels Dare is just excellent. My only complaint is that it's a little too ballad heavy, but even then, I still love those songs. Number seven, Paul Stanley. When people talk about the 78 solo albums, they usually say that Asus was good and the rest were not. And I don't agree with that. I think this is a fantastic album packed with great material. Bob Kulik's guitar playing adds a lot. These are great songs. The only reason that Ace's 78 album ranks higher for me is because I don't like Hold Me, Touch Me. Speaking of Ace, number six, Ace Fraley. It's just awesome. Ace at his best. Killer hooks, great guitar playing, amazing album. Number five, Union. After being let go from Kiss for the sake of the reunion tour, Bruce teamed up with Karabi, who had recently left Motley Crue, for the same reason. They, along with Brent Fitz and Jamie Hunting, formed Union. Their debut album was released in 1998. Union is maybe the most underrated band in rock. It is ridiculous how good they were, and I wish that had translated into success. This album is amazing, with cool guitar parts, interesting lyrics, and great singing from Karabi. Number four, The Blue Room, Union. Union's second and final album. It sounds fantastic. Hunting and Fitz are great throughout. The guitars are cool as fuck. The lyrics are great. It's all excellent. Number three, Love Gun. The top three are somewhat interchangeable, and it was hard to decide on a definitive ranking for them. I love this album. I think it's an interesting combination of the two albums that preceded it. It features some of the absolute best songs of the catalog. The reason I put it at number three is because of Then She Kissed Me. I enjoy that song, but it's a weird ending. Number two, Rock and Roll Over. No fancy bells and whistles, just lean, loud, hungry, kick-ass rock and roll. For a lot of people, this is the definitive Kiss album, which is funny because Kiss barely plays anything from it nowadays. But it's great. Kramer was such a good fit for the band. And number one, Destroyer. For me, these top three albums form a definitive trilogy that best represents the band. I love all three, but Destroyer just barely edges the others out. I love Ezrin's production, and he really pushed the band. They all became bedroom musicians and songwriters because of him. It's just an incredible album. That wraps up the ranking. Let me know in the comments if you've also listened to all of these albums, what your ranking is, and if I missed anything. Like and subscribe? Am I doing this right? I feel like I'm a terrible YouTuber.